Hi, good afternoon. I think we're live. Um, so yeah. welcome, everybody. My name is Rabia Dadu. I'm a clinical research associate with the Center for Health Equity Transformation. And um, I want to thank you all for joining us today for our Chat Chat Spotlight series, which highlights the work of our invited speakers and fosters dialogue on advancing health equity. Uh, the Center for Health Equity Transformation, uh, the mission is to lift health for all by exposing root causes of health inequities and serving as a hub that pushes boundaries in research, education, workforce development, and community engagement. Our vision is to bridge the gaps between research, community needs, and policy by transforming systems and structures so that everyone has the opportunity to achieve their best possible health. Uh, so before we get started, I want to encourage um, a couple of Save the Date um, for upcoming events. One is next Monday, May 22nd at 12 p.m. We'll be hosting uh, at Central, 12 p.m. Central. We'll be hosting a panel discussion for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month on the topic of anti-Asian uh, hate. So please um, look out for that and, and uh, we'll put it in the chat for registration. The other is uh, in, on Thursday, June 15th, 12 p.m. We celebrate Juneteenth this year with special guest, Dr. Arlene Geronimus, who is the author of Weathering the Extraordinary Stress of Ordinary Life in an Unjust World, and also our very own Northwestern's Dr. Inger Burnett Ziegler, who's also an author of a book called Nobody Knows, The Trouble I've Seen, The Emotional Lives of Black Women. Uh, but for today's talk, we're happy to have um, Dr. Timothy Brick, um, who will um, be talking about public health challenges and resilience during the war. Um, he is uh, a provost at the Kiev School of Economics. He is a national coordinator of the European Social Survey and a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. Northwestern University welcomes uh, Dr. Brick as the Roberta Buffett Visiting Professor of International Studies in the Department of Sociology at the Roberta Buffett Institute. He's also co-chair of the Social Inequality Network at the European Social Science History Conference. His uh, paper, When Com Church Competition Matters, won the N. Panina Award in 2018 by the Institute of Sociology of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. He received his PhD in Carlos III of Madrid um, and his master's, uh, master in science in Utrecht University and also uh, a master's in at Kiev um, National University. Uh, everyone, please welcome and joining and uh, joining me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Brick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. This is a real honor to be in Northwestern and in Evanston in person. I'm visiting here for a spring quarter and our cooperation and friendship with Northwestern University started about maybe every a week uh, after the Russian aggression uh, was launched on Kiev uh, last year. I, uh, I live in Kiev and I work in Kiev and I am um, uh, staying in my basement and in bomb shelters and uh, staying in sometimes my shower room because it was the safest place in the apartment. You know, I was doing a lot of outreach and a lot of activities to talk to my international colleagues and to advocate to support Ukraine and to share Ukrainian perspective on the war. And I think that Northwestern was one of the most uh, proactive institutions which uh, responded to our calls. We organized a lot of uh, joint panels and conferences and, uh, and, we, and then later I was invited to come here in person to share my perspective and my research to uh, local audiences. So I'm very grateful for that and very honored to be a part of this partnership. And today I will be presenting uh, my perspective on, on the issues related to public health in Ukraine. However, I should emphasize that I'm not um, from this field. I'm a sociologist, so I study public opinion, policy, uh, national identities in Ukraine. Uh, nevertheless, our organization is quite big. We have a, a lot of different teams, and I will be presenting data collected by you know our team, our partners, our friends. So. Uh, and I'll try to tell you a coherent story about what is happening in Ukraine, what has happened and what can happen in the future. Um, this photo is, uh, you know, this is my university, Kiev School of Economics, uh, which is located in Kiev. And these students were admitted during the war. So we are still operational. We uh, teach on campus and it gives a 
magnificent sense of community for our students who uh, are quite motivated to be there on campus as well because it's much better for them and for their mental health you know to go through this uh, stress uh, together as a community and i guess this will be uh, a part of my message today yeah, i will be talking about ukraine and challenges to ukraine but also that it's quite possible to go through it if you are united in some social cohesion and as community you you can work and live through um you know a lot of challenges so um the talk is structured in the following way that you know we want to discuss any policy and any big social issue in in, in ukraine and beyond it's nice to first uh, check some data on you know the damages what was destroyed in ukraine how did it affect um uh health institutions public health of people to discuss some data on on people in terms of you know what are the perceptions feelings stress attitude will spirit but also organizations and ties whether people are capable to to resist and to be resilient and how come and then if we want to think about you know what should we do later how can we improve the situation in ukraine or rebuild the country we can discuss policies and political debates uh you know on where can we get resources from and what are the priorities for reconstruction and of course i'll be you know happy to chat with you during the q a uh, session so let's start with uh, some data on damages um so our organization key school of economics has three pillars its university charitable foundation and think tank so our think tank is one of the major uh suppliers of all data about ukraine so if you read something you know in washington post or the economist and you see some data about reconstruction most likely this data came from us and according to our uh and we work with government and other ngos in ukraine so it's a it's a huge collective effort but we are kind of uh, leading this effort so according to the most uh recent data we published on our website um the total direct damages to ukrainian infrastructure is accounted to 143 uh almost 44 billion of dollars this is a huge number given that the whole gdp of ukraine is 200 billion dollars the 75 percent of ukrainian gdp and these direct damages uh, in simple word it means that there are a lot of residential buildings roads uh bridges were destroyed just wiped out uh some of these damages of, uh, include education and healthcare. so um out of this 144 billion dollars 2.7 is about uh, damages to healthcare. and when i say healthcare, i mostly mean clinic and hospitals so more than 1100 of those were destroyed uh, two, and 50% of these damages are in two regions of Ukraine, Kharkiv and Donetsk region. They're more to the east. They're closer to Russia and they were attacked significantly by, you know, shellings and airstrikes. Uh, educational institutions suffered more. Uh, it's almost $9 billion, uh, meaning that this includes everything. Kindergartens, schools, universities, labs that were destroyed or uh, damaged significantly. Um, well, what does it mean for people? Yeah, so you have the whole nation uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, attacked under attack, and it means that a lot of people suffered. Uh, World Health Organizations, United Nations, they collect data about uh, deceased people who, uh, civilians who died uh, due to the war effort. There are different numbers. People report from 18,000 of, of, of people to more than 20,000 of people. Still, we don't know the whole data uh, specifically. Uh, another issue is that uh, not all territories uh, of Ukraine, you know, we, we have nice exporter and uh, information share. So we don't really know about what's happening in all territories but yeah more than twenty thousand civilians uh, died uh, a lot of people are wounded harmed uh, but also you can you know we can start uh, thinking not only about uh, this kind of damages but uh, mental health as well 
So according to the Minister of Health, Viktor Leshko, in the summer last year, he estimated that out of 40 million of Ukrainians, 15 million will require psychological assistance. Assistance. These numbers were backed up with uh, uh, World Health Organization experts who traveled to Ukraine and who, you know, collected data and made their assessments. And um, Forbes Ukraine published a very interesting article because they made the assessment of how many antidepressants uh, were sold in Ukraine. And even though the whole pharmacological market declined by about 3% of sales, specifically antidepressants increased in their both sales in terms of money, but also in terms of packages, you know, how many packages were sold on the market. So increase uh, in money was by 41%. So obviously mental health is a huge problem for Ukraine now. Uh, according to various reports, we have more, uh, just for the period of this war, 27,000 uh, people with disabilities. Um, uh, well, the war uh, um, produced this, these numbers, 27,000 of people with uh, disabilities. We have surveys conducted by the International Republican Institute saying that, you know, 80% of respondents said that their emotional well-being uh, declined specifically due to the war. Uh, there was another quite interesting survey uh, where respondents were mothers. So it was a big sample of randomized sample of mothers who said that uh, the health, physical health and mental health of their children declined. So the share of children with very good state of physical and mental health declined from 33% to 17 and 11, respectively. Um, this graph comes from the survey uh, conducted by an online polling company. So the caveat of this survey is that it's not fully representative for all Ukraine, it's only urban uh, population. And this, uh, this is a subjective evaluation of stress. So people are asked, are you stressed or not? And you know, this is the percentage of people who said that they are stressed. And there was increase from, you know, almost 80 to 88%. So things not like a huge increase. Nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, still there are other surveys that show that people feel quite stressful. This is an interesting part of this survey. The question was, uh, can you tell which specific emotions or what kind of feelings you have? And most people, like 40% of people would say that they feel stressed, that they're tired, but they also have hope. And then from 20 to 26% of people said that they feel fear, anger, but also they're proud. They're proud, meaning, you know, of the nations and soldiers who, who, who um, defend the country. Um, a big part of this problem is, of course, displaced population, and we'll speak about it more. Uh, the war affected a huge part of Ukrainian territory, and a lot of people moved either internally, IDPs, internally displaced people, or migrants, refugees who moved to Europe, European Union, Canada, America. There are also numbers of uh, people who were moved, forcefully moved to Russia. And we don't have very solid numbers. We don't really know how many kids or adults were moved to Russia, but definitely this is a, this is a big problem. These numbers on the slide, uh, they come from um, World Health Organization. So just to give a bit more sense of on Ukrainians, their subjective perspective uh, on the war, what do they feel, um, whether they're stressed, uh, and what are the sources of this stress. So this uh, data comes from a very interesting source. So this is a panel data. Uh, so if uh, panel or longitudinal data means that the same people, the same sample can be approached and again and again, and you can repeat the same questions to the same people, so you can see how answers change over time. And uh, so we have a sample of people, and, and the questions were asked before and after the invasion last year, and we have this increase so that, you know, before the invasion in the sample, about 4% of people said that they see war-related nightmares, and now it's 35, 34% of people. So it's a huge increase, also a huge increase in exposure. So 5% uh, of people before they said that, you know, they have some family member fighting in the war. Now it's 33% of people. And now about 84% say that they personally know someone 
in the front you know it can be relative friend colleague so yeah so people have a huge exposure to war and this has affected their level of stress and they even see war related dreams at the same time i want to um, emphasize that there is a quite interesting observation that bugs a lot of people it's almost a paradox that despite these uh, difficulties and despite this crisis we also see that ukrainians demonstrate significant level of optimism and social cohesion so we know that the economy of ukraine has suffered a lot we know that a lot of civilians died or were moved uh, their displaced people or refugees and we know that they are very stressed at the same time people often provide some positive answers so this graph is a subjective evaluation of economic well-being so people are asked whether they have you know enough of money uh, uh, and um, kind of the the question was phrased that whether the money you have now is close to the sufficient number uh, to survive. And you know, more people uh, now say that they have uh, enough or even higher than sufficient, which is a bit surprising. Yeah, we, we know that this is not true, but that's how people say. Yeah, they have a very strong subjective, uh, positive uh, feeling about their uh, economic uh, well being trust to formal institutions increase significantly so this question is whether there is any political leader in ukraine who could effectively manage the country so before and after the war there is a significant increase in number of people who said yes that people now believe that there is such a political leader there are many other surveys that show consistently that ukrainians have trust in formal institutions more than from 80 to 90 percent depending on the survey and how question is framed. A respondent said that they trust the president, to government, to parliament, to military, which is uh, quite surprising because in the scholarship, Ukraine has been known as a low trust society, which has changed uh, in the course of, of this uh, invasion. Um, and this is a very interesting index designed by Ukrainian sociologists. So basically they ask, a bunch of questions, maybe 15 or 18, I don't remember exactly. And the questions are framed in terms of what do you believe about others? Do you think that other people tend to lie? Do you think that other people say true truth only if they're afraid of being caught? Uh, do you think that lie is the best strategy to survive? So there are a lot of questions about that. And then you can average these questions. You run statistical, you know, um, uh, tests to make sure that they uh, coherent and then you have an index of uh, cynicism and we observe from the 90s until now that now we have the lowest index of cynicism in the history of ukraine and people who can be classified as cynical the number of them uh, the shares of these people declined uh, after the beginning of this current russian aggression this is another uh, data which could be interested for you know to understand the context this question is about identity so ukrainians are asked uh, about uh, so the questioner is framed in a way uh, that people are presented with a list of identities and you can choose the stronger identity the one identity which speaks to you the most uh, so it can be ukrainian nation or it can be the whether you are a dweller of your town or village, maybe you feel like a global person or a person who was born in Soviet Union. So you have to pick one identity. And this is the share of people who said that they feel strongly, most strongly as uh, that they belong to Ukrainian nation. And there is a st slow pattern um, that for many years in Ukraine, about 40, 45% and 50% of people believed that they belong to Ukrainian nation. And after 2013, after the Euromaidan revolution, there was a slow but steady trend of increasing in the shares up to 60, 65%. And we know from other studies that this was a universal trend for all generations, gender and uh, regions. So people from different parts of Ukraine, they show uh, this coherency in this trend. And when the war started, the current aggression started, there was a jump from 40, 
uh, from 64 to 84 percent. You could argue that this is a rally around the flag effect, but uh, still it is persistent even now, and I will uh, speculate a bit more about that uh, in the slides in a few minutes. So I guess, ah, and, um, and another interesting observation would be observed from surveys, from different surveys, sometimes it's cross-sectional, sometimes it's panel, but we see that Ukrainians value democracy even now during the hardships of war as the best um, type of governance. So Ukrainians, at least they adhere to the idea that democracy is, is nice. So uh, to sum up, we have this paradoxical situation when you know we have a terrible crisis, we have war, we have invasion, a lot of people are displaced, the government is under a huge pressure, economy suffers, and at the same time, people feel uh, unity, they rally together, they trust the president, to government, and they believe that uh, the war can be over. And I think this is very important, you know, for for us as policymakers, and in regardless whether we study, you know, economy or uh, public health, it's important to understand the population, their motives, and their capacity. So a few words about uh, governance. Yeah. So as I said, um, a huge part of Ukrainians are now internally displaced. According to most recent estimations, it's about 5 million of people out of 40 million of people. So 5 out of 40 is quite significant. With uh, And we know that about 20% of them are kids. So it's a huge number of people who have to be taken care of. Uh, this slide shows a shift, uh, what blue lines and red lines on this slide. So blue line is about IDPs, displaced people, that were in Ukraine before this current aggression. So for us, for Ukrainians, the war started not a year ago, but in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea, part of Donetsk, part of Lugansk. So there were a lot of IDPs already. Historically, most of these IDPs settled in big urban areas, like they were to the city of Kharkiv, or to the city of Kiev, or to the city of Lviv. So there were popular parts of displaced people already, uh, even a year, five years ago. But now you see a lot of red lines, red bars, meaning that there is no exception. All Ukrainian regions, all Ukrainian regions with no exceptions, now they have accepted new IDPs. And the reason why I'm showing that is to stress that all regions of Ukraine now over, overwhelmed with, uh, with uh, some challenges of social support, because it means that in all regions we have to think about how to provide shelter, how to provide kindergartens, how to provide healthcare facilities. So it, it has become a universal challenge for all parts of Ukraine. Uh, these numbers show state budget decline in specifically in education. So universities now have uh, lower support financially from government than before. And the third one um, uh, is about uh, universities that are specifically uh, about health. These are um, academies and universities where people are trained to be doctors and nurses. So uh, there is a certain decline of, um, of budgeting as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge for Ukraine. Um, so I'll say a few more words about government, the government mode of governance. So I just presented that, you know, uh, all regions of Ukraine now uh, suffer from uh, having influx of IDPs and we have to be careful and smart about how to, you know, deal with them. Um, and here on this map, um, you can see uh, Ukraine divided in communities. So um, I have it's important to, to understand for, for the context of what is happening in Ukraine, uh, the history of Ukraine, of, of present history of Ukraine, can be divided in what happened before 2014 and after 2014. So after 2014, uh, the new government was in place, um, uh, and a lot of reforms happened after the Euromaidan revolution. And many of these reforms empowered regions and local communities. 
So one of these reforms was about public procurement. Public procurement is a very big part of Ukrainian GDP, is about 30% of Ukrainian GDP. And public procurement means that, you know, there are a lot of government or public companies or public organizations, state-owned organizations, like it can be a public clinic or school or a healthcare facility. And suppose they need to buy a car or a computer or a printing machine. And so you do it through procurement and, you know, there was a lot of corruption there. You can say, well, I'll buy the computer from my nephew or from my uncle or something like that. But now all procurement is digital. And after 2013, procurement became uh, digital, transparent and through auctions. Uh, land reform, uh, liber liberalizing land market uh, was introduced. Um, decentralization. Decentralization was a very strong reform that empowered local regions, meaning that before 2014, Ukraine was very centralized society with a capital city deciding how to collect taxes and how to spend public money uh, on public goods um, in the regions, but not anymore. Now we have communities and amalgamated communities, meaning that there are local towns and cities who are neighbors. They decided to join in community and now they have a lot of self-governance. And, uh, you know, if, 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 if a business is registered in a community and this business pays salaries, so this income taxes, 60% of this income taxes, they can stay in a community and 40% go to the capital city. And local communities have more agency in deciding how to spend this money on you know, fixing roads or providing water supply. We now have a gender quota for uh, local elections, meaning that you know, local leadership is more competitive and diverse, uh, not to mention uh, that there are such things as uh, participatory budgets, meaning that local communities, like people, they come come together and they can vote on which packages, uh, uh, which public policies can be supported by, by local government. So there are quite a lot of reforms that influence everything, including healthcare provision. Uh, and on this map, you can see blue, dark blue and light blue uh, parts. Dark blue are the unique kind of pioneers in this reform. There were communities that amalgamated way earlier than others because they felt that you know they were more proactive and they wanted to to achieve uh, this uh, fruits of decentralization earlier. And other communities were late adopters of this reform. And black dots they are respondents. So we have panel data. And we can geographically identify people who live in these communities before and after the reform. And we can run different you know, statistical models. And what we saw is that uh, after the decentralization, there was a significant increase in trust to local government, not to president, not to national government, but, but to local government. And we also know from other data that there was also increase in trust to neighbors. So people start trusting to neighbors. And the reason why I'm spending, you know, a lot of time talking about that is to emphasize that a big part of Ukrainian resilience, which you observe now, comes from these uh, administrative reforms that empowered local communities to be more proactive, to have more agency, to have more social cohesion. So people now trust each other. People do a lot of things together and people want to defend their communities. And this is also a source of resilience that now during the war, People can be more active and quick and adaptive at the level of communities. And now they have more freedom and agency even to, you know, to, to accept uh, IDPs and to find solutions through government and volunteers and international donors. They work all together kind of peer to peer to, uh, to provide uh, health care help and mental health, mental health help and et cetera. So uh, I can speak a bit about recovery and some, I, I think it will take more, maybe seven, 10 minutes more and, and we can, and I, I can take questions. So uh, recovery is a very big thing. You know, we have to think how to rebuild Ukraine, uh, how to fix uh, things. So one of the ways to think about recovery is very, you know, primitive and simple. You just calculate uh, costs of everything that was lost. And you say, well, we need this money to rebuild things that were lost. Uh, obviously, you can also add to that. You can think maybe we need some 
more resources to invest, not only to rebuild, but also to make it a better place. Uh, and there were different conferences about that. So there was a presentation of a recovery and development plan in Lugano in July 2022. There were more conferences and dialogues between, between Ukrainian government and international agencies. And recently there was a report by World Bank, Ukrainian government and Key School of Economics. And we identified that the minimum uh, reconstruction re recovery need is 411 billion with uh, priorities in transportation, housing, energy, social protection, livelihood, and explosive hazard management, agriculture. Meaning that there are quite a lot of lands that are mined. And uh, this is also a huge source of concern for health uh, and safety of people. Um, so there are some concerns, you know, on political debates on how we can rebuild Ukraine. Uh, on the one hand, there is a big political debate, you know, a lot of people in the United States and globally, they're concerned whether should we send money to Ukraine because this is like, you know, weak, corrupted society. I think it's a fundamentally flawed perception. It's historically outdated. Uh, we have a lot of progress in dealing with corruption and accountability. As I mentioned, we had this reform of public procurement, but also reform of National Bank of Ukraine and governmental reforms and changes in power. So I think Ukraine has shown that it's quite capable and transparent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, local agents in Ukraine, they're also concerned that, you know, big, huge international organizations like uh, World Health Organization, United Nations, World Bank, sometimes they are too slow and uh, not very adaptive. They don't often, they don't have people on the ground, so they don't have exposure to information. Uh, in a way, the money is spent, you know, they take huge overheads. So I think local Ukrainian NGOs and organizations, they can spend money more, efficient, more efficiently. And there is a concern about overcomplicated compliance, so which uh, which does not allow local um, organizations, you know, to be very adaptive and quick. Uh, there was this notorious case with the World Health Organization. I think it happened just you know during the first months of the war of this current aggression, when uh, you know. Uh, this organization demanded some data from Ukraine, but Ukrainian government didn't want to give to share data about how many hospitals or were destroyed, how many doctors suffered. Because for us, it was also, uh, you know, uh, it's a critical information. So we didn't want to share this information because of security reasons, and we didn't want to give Russia uh, information to how, how efficient their attacks are or not. And there was a big debate between Ukrainian government and World Health Organization, what information can be shared and what cannot be shared. So, and I think this is a point that, you know, um, that, that um, uh, sometimes policies and methodologies, you know, they have to be updated and contextualized in what is happening now. So there is a lot of mutual concern and trust, but it seems that there has been a lot of positive uh, change in this respect. And the Ukrainian government and the international organization, they work closely, you know, hand to hand. And I think, uh, um, yeah, there has been a lot of progress. And, um, and uh, yeah, I will finish saying that uh, it's, I think, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud that I belong to the university and I work in university now during the work because, you know, I'm a sociologist and all my life I, I read in, in smart books and smart papers that human capital and social capital matter, but that it is only now that I can actually understand it. I feel it. I see it with my own eyes that there are, you know, a lot of people, if, if they're smart, if they're capable, if they have this feeling of uh respect uh to community and social cohesion and they work together and they trust uh to each other they can achieve a lot and universities now they became most crucial agents in ukraine because universities are the places where human and social capital are forged because that's the place where you can give people knowledge and skills but also where people build friendships and ties and uh, our own university, our own charitable foundation contributed to, to, to what is happening in Ukraine, to resilience of Ukraine significantly. So for the past year, we, we collected more than $55 million in donations. And we supported Ukrainians with medical kits, helmets, 
cars, food, med uh, medicine supplies. And we help, we managed, we helped to put together a lot of great organizations and people to rebuild a clinic in uh, north, northern than Kiev. So it was a huge infrastructure project that usually, you know, uh, universities usually do not build stuff, but uh, we managed to, to participate in this event, in this huge um, enterprise. And these are our students, students of master policy, uh, master students in policy. And immediately most of them volunteered, most of them volunteered to be paramedics. Uh, but then with time, they also switched to be, you know, to, to, to serve in artillery or uh, infantry. And uh, one of these people, uh, the girl to the left, Tata Margarian, she's my colleague. She's a manager of our uh, global affairs office. And she volunteered, she was a paramedic herself. And now she teaches uh, tactical medicine to our own students because uh, physical health and mental health has been embedded as a big part of curriculums of Ukrainian universities and our university as well. And this is a National Psychological Association of Ukraine. We have a special agreement with them, a memorandum, so we work together uh, and they're experts. They supply uh, psychologists so they can help uh, our students, but also they provide trainings, you know, for, for our staff that we can uh, understand and identify um, when our students have problems, mental health problems, so we can have some quick uh, response to that. We help to rebuild schools, not only clinics, and we help to identify displaced students. So if some students are displaced, but you know they, um, we want to find them, we want to preserve their human capital, uh, to incubate talent, uh, we help to place them to best universities around the world, like to University of Toronto, City University of London, NYU, with the idea that after they finish their full degrees, they can come back to Ukraine and, and rebuild the nation. So that's what's happening in Kiev right now. I, I feel very jealous because, you know, I'm in the United States, but my friends and students are in Kiev and they are running these uh, Olympiads. These are not our students. These are pupils, high schoolers from all over Ukraine, West, South, North, participating in uh, competition in prompts for chat GPT. So how to use prompts to write better code to solve policy questions. And this is happening on campus right now. And we managed to build decent security systems. We have bomb shelters. So in case of alarm, kids go to the basement and they can study there because there are very decent uh, study rooms with boards, internet, computer, desks. Uh, we have generators, you know, we have food, uh, everything, water. So uh, a lot of students, they actually prefer to, to stay on campus and some of them uh, play these games they had night overs. So students, they stay in university, they, they sleep in tents, you know, they hang out together, they do homework. There is this enormous sense of community which helps uh, students and faculty to go through. Um, we also organize this new union or alliance of, of Ukrainian universities to share these experiences and to share resources and to provide help to local communities as well. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think the next stage, what we have already announced that, that uh, this new admission campaign we will make with significant uh, discounts. Uh, and sometimes it will be zero tuition fees for kids uh, who, who were exposed to war, whose parents are fighting, who lived in occupied territories. Because during the war, it's very important to make education accessible to everyone so we can invest in human and social capital. So in the future, the country will be even more uh, resilient. And this is a website of our foundation. As I said, we already uh, collected more than $55 million to, to help Ukraine, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian citizens, and we don't stop there. So I would appreciate if you can, you know, take a look at our website, share it among your friends, and maybe we can build some partnerships together. So, so that's it. It was a very broad presentation about, you know, situation in Ukraine, about our work, but also about public health uh, issues. And I understand it was very broad. So I would be very, you know, happy to to chat with you about more specific um, figures or data during the Q and A's. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Brick. Uh, we're gonna move on to the Q&A portion. So uh, my name is Araceli Estrada. I'm a coordinator here with the Center for Health Equity Transformation, along with my colleague, Emilia Ferreira, uh, who will also be helping us moderate the question and answer. If you haven't already done so, please drop in any questions you have in the Q&A box. Um, but with that, we'll get started. I don't know if you wanna get us started, Amelia. Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, could you please talk briefly about the flaws in Western security architecture in 2022 to 2023? For example, Russia's role in the UN Security Council, veto power, presidency, et cetera. Yeah, sure, it's, um, it's a very good, and again, very broad question. It's not necessarily related to public health, but still, I think it's very important to you know to to address it. I think that the whole world uh, and Western world specifically was not really ready for this war and did not have nice uh, diplomatic and military solutions to what was happening. You know, Russia was an aggressor in two thousand eight when attacked Georgia. Russia was aggressor in two thousand fourteen when it attacked and uh, annexed uh, Crimea. Uh, then Russia was an aggressor in Ukraine. The whole, the whole world was witnessing, you know, Russian troopers marching into Ukraine and Russian missiles hitting Ukrainian civilians. And there was no solution for that. The world was just waiting, you know, and it took a lot of initiative from Ukrainian side to convince Western world that we are resilient. We, we will defend our land and we, mm, we deserve trust and, and respect so we can be supported militarily and humanitarian in, in terms of humanitarian aid. Yeah, so I think it was a huge issue and uh, it's nice that now we, we kind of have addressed it already. Russia is a big part of international diplomatic community. Yeah, it's a part of uh, United Nations and security councils and basically it can veto whatever they want and this cannot be solved. So uh, I think it, it is a big flaw on, um, I think international community should recognize uh, that Russia should be excluded from these major institutions. Um, another thing that, uh, which I already slightly mentioned during the, you know, during the presentation, that there were issues with uh, approaches and frameworks in a way that many international organizations, they apply methodologies that are outdated, sort of, you know, this is also my personal experience when we work on the ground and we need to, you know, to execute a project or to have fundraising or to spend resources on something. Very often, uh, international methodologies they cannot be applied. You know, they like in terms of audits or compliance or planning or data collection. You know, we are always said that well, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Why? Well, because ten years ago or twenty years ago we decided this in our department meeting when we were working in some other country. Yeah? So international organizations are kind of slow in responding to crises. But uh, having said that, I, I need to acknowledge that a lot of progress has happened. But again, because Ukraine was pushing for, for this change. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I answered you know, to, to the question directly. It's a, it's a really broad question, but I think that uh, the bottom line is uh, the flow is there. It's uh, the system is not perfect, um, and it should be changed. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Um, moving along to a more public health focused topic, um, how does or how has misinformation and disinformation, um, for example, and like uh, commonly used like social media. Um, applications and websites influenced um, some of these public health challenges in Ukraine um, and has like COVID-19 also, you know, amplified. Yeah. yeah, I would argue that the resilience of Ukrainian communities and government uh, can be contributed to um, a big part of this resilience is drawn from the experiences after the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, the government and communities learned a lot from the pandemic crisis. 
uh, a lot of processes were digitalized. Um, you know, people were learn how to work from home. People learned how to, uh, the government learned how to uh, make bureaucracy more transparent and digitalized. A lot of Ukrainians um, use like a significant population, more than half of Ukrainians use a special application called DIA or Action, which is the, gov the government produced. So if this application allows you to have digital copies of your passport, of your uh, social security number, uh, driving license, but also you can receive funds uh, using this application. So if you belong to a certain social group, the government can immediately send you money, you know, to support you if you have, you know, if, if, if you, I don't know, uh, suffer from injury or something like that, or if you're a displaced person, yeah? So it's, you can be easily identified in the governmental list and money can be sent directly to your account. You can also pay taxes using, using this application. So there were a lot of flexibility uh, because government and population learned from the COVID, uh, from the crisis during the COVID. Uh, social media uh, were pivotal uh, during this war. They're still pivotal uh, for information share, for, uh, for cohesion purposes. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of um, uh, special operations on both sides. Russians and Ukrainians use social media to target each other, to spread misinformation and to influence um, attitudes and uh, worldviews of people. I can share with you some personal stories as well. You know, when I stayed in Kiev and uh, with my girlfriend, you know, we were worried. We were staying in our basement and we were thinking, like, should we... Should we run from this city or should we stay? Are we safe? Are we not safe? Of course, the only way to connect with the world for us was social media. We had our smartphones and there were a lot of misinformation. You know, every day we received some messages and messages were shared in like TikTok, Instagram, Telegram, Facebook. And the messages were something like, you know, tomorrow uh, Russian soldiers will come personally and kill you or something like that. You know, so people were really stressed. People were afraid that uh, things like that could happen. There were misinformation about uh, about specific attacks which never happened. There were misinformation about leadership, saying that you, the leadership of your country resigned, so you should resign as well. So of course, this affected motivation of people, but also you know uh, psychological uh, stress as well. At the same time, people use social media just to relate to each other, to find social cohesion, to receive high quality information because you can actually verify stuff very quickly using social media as well if you can double check with uh, governmental resources with media resources with local activists uh, who are very active on social media you can social use social media just to relate to others i give you another personal story uh, and believe it or not but during the first weeks of of the invasion there was one ukrainian stand-up uh, comedian who performed in the bomb shelter. You know, he was in bomb shelter. He was stressed. He wanted to calm down people around him. And he made this, you know, stand-up comedy in bomb shelter. And he put it on YouTube, on YouTube. And it was one of the most viral videos of that uh, weeks because, you know, people were sitting in their bomb shelters. And it was so easy to relate to this guy. And people were sharing to each other the video and saying like, oh, look, we all are in bomb shelters, but at least we can have, you know, have some fun together so that's how people related to each other and um, you know and and coped with difficulties the same can be said about music a lot of new pop culture quickly emerged and was transferred through social media so social media was pivotal for spread of misinformation but also valid information to stress people but and to unite people it's a huge huge part of our life now and that's why now we have a lot of uh, NGOs, media experts that, you know, shape uh, social media. Government is very actively present on social media. The president Zelensky himself is on Instagram and Twitter. We have the whole Ministry of Digital Transformation. Um, 
so I th a lot of uh, volunteers and credible people are on social media and uh, social media has become a big part of curriculum in, in universities because kids are taught how to use social media and how to, to, to be critical when you read social media. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have another question. It's what do you believe is the future of Ukraine's economic growth? Good question. No, of course, look, this is a huge crisis. The Ukrainian economy has suffered significantly in direct damages. We lost a lot of uh, residential buildings, bridges, roads, meaning that, you know, the whole cities were destroyed. Someone has to rebuild these cities. In terms of uh, occupations, sure, a lot of people lost their jobs, uh, specifically people who worked in factories in, um, in south and east of Ukraine um wage decline happen uh, of course in ukraine so it's a huge huge crisis the problem is now how to rebuild the country and how to revitalize the economy so the number first uh, solution would be to stop the war you need to stop the war and so far in ukraine the only way to stop the war from the ukrainian perspective is uh, that russia has to be defeated uh, we cannot allow any frozen conflict any frozen conflict automatically implies that they will attack again. So Russia has to be defeated. Uh, territories uh, must be um, deoccupied. You know, every time we go into a village or into a city, we see that there were tortures, that there were crimes against humanity. So these territories have to be properly secured and people have to be saved. And then we can think about rebuilding Ukraine. I think no one. Well, there are different approaches to rebuilding. And I think the approach we need to take is that we, we should not replicate what was there before. We, we do not need to build the same coal mines or the same steel industry factories. The best thing to, would be to build something that you know, the, the whole world can benefit from. So we should think about you know, global challenges like climate change, global security, health. It would be much better to invest in Ukraine and build their uh, technological companies, uh, global security companies, things like that. And um, if if the whole world has uh, some skin in this game, you know, if uh, uh, if we can work together on rebuilding, I think it can guarantee the economic growth of Ukraine as well. Um, right now, these efforts have started already uh, there is a big international coalition to rebuild ukraine i know that denmark netherlands well in general you know european union and united states they have already started investing in rebuilding uh, buildings roads and facilities in ukraine so yeah we just have to keep keep doing that so in the long run uh, the war has to stop by russia has to be defeated and then you know we can rebuild the country uh, aiming for fixing global challenges as well, not only Ukrainian challenges. In the short run, Ukraine just needs a kind of flow of resources. So right now, Ukraine, despite all the economic damages, Ukraine operational, you know, banks are working. Uh, currency exchange is quite decent. Uh, you know, people have their jobs. Uh, the problem is that um, the supply chains were broken. You know, we, we, we did a survey. We did a survey of businessmen and we know from their answer that they can produce stuff. They still have clients. But the problem is that if you want to ship something from one city to another city, it's complicated because the roads or bridges were destroyed. Yeah. So we need to rebuild that. We need to rebuild roads. We need to make sure that supply chains are okay. Mm. And we need to ensure some uh, cash flow, you know, because people, there, are, there is a lot of talent, there is a lot of capacity, institutions are working, people are there, but you just need, you know, some cash flow for them to, to sustain decent quality of life, but that can be solved with international, you know, donors and, and support. Yeah, that's, I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Um, I think we might have time for one or two more questions. Um, before we have to close out. Um, I see here from Anya, thank you for this excellent presentation. The information on increased trust in political leaders, decreased cynicism, et cetera, are fascinating. Do you foresee these effects being long lasting? 
Um, and then they go on to say, I imagine the increased mental health needs will undoubtedly be long lasting. Sure, it's, uh, it's an excellent question. So we know that sometimes these things can be attributed to what is called rally around the flag. Yeah, it's maybe some people just get excited, people get optimistic, and then in one or two years, it disappears. In history of Ukraine, it did happen that after one of the revolutions, 2004 Orange Revolution, the trust to president increased and then declined. Having said that, I am more optimistic now because right now these levels of trust, they are supported by real institutional changes. Decentralization was a real reform with long lasting consequences. Our military has improved and uh, you know, uh, what the government is doing now is not, well, they have, um, they do have a lot of sustainable projects, which means that uh, uh, social cohesion will follow that. So my, my, my argument here is that social cohesion and social trust will be lasting as long as we observe real socioeconomic and administrative reforms, and we do observe them. That's why I'm more optimistic uh, in this respect. And I believe it's not just the rally around the flag, it will have long, uh, long uh, term effect. And uh, I agree that uh, psychological issues and mental health issues are long lasting. Uh, it's very difficult even to measure the extent of them. Uh, definitely generations will be affected by, by uh, psychological issues. There is also a question about reestablishing connections with Russian universities. When the war ends, it I think it really depends on on Russia and Russian universities. So I think obviously because of the war, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know negative emotions between Ukrainians and Russians. Ukrainians feel uh, not only that Russia is a state aggressor state which attacked Ukraine unjustifiably. Ukrainians are also very disappointed with civil society and intellectual elites in Russia because intellectual elites have endorsed this war or they didn't, you know, didn't know how to address it. And I think that Russia as a society has to go through a long process of decolonizational, you know, kind of mindset. De they have this uh, mindset of being imperialistic power, so Russia does not recognize uh, agency and cultural independence of their neighbors like Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, Kazakhstan. And universities are pillars of this intellectual arrogancy, I would say. I mean, I'm sharing with you my personal opinions here. So we can get along with universities and intellectual elites in the future as long as we will see attempts to decolonization and the imperialization in their mindsets, views, and policies. Uh, you cannot pretend that the war did not happen. You know, if the war ends and Russian university says, like, well, we are neighbors, let's pretend nothing happened, let's start an exchange program for our students. No, this will never work. We need a real dialogue, a real apology, and a real conscious approach to what happened. Thank you so much, Dr. Brick. It looks like we're at the end of the hour. Uh, I want to take this time to um, say that we truly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today um, and to the group here. Um, we will share some of the links and the resources that you shared um, in a follow-up email with the participants. And if you weren't able to catch the full presentation, the recording will be made available um, as soon as next week. Um, and a friendly reminder that we have another upcoming event coming on next Monday, May 22nd on uh, Asian American History Month um, related to health and um, history, as well as our Juneteenth celebration coming up on Thursday, June 15th. So lots to look forward to. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor.